Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Mimi White, whose quiet, honest poetry has found readers and fans far beyond her home in the seacoast region of New Hampshire. Mimi is a warm, wonderful teacher who has spent 25 years helping students of all ages create original and authentic work, be it poetry, memoir, or nonfiction. She understands how to help people find their authentic voice. I know that firsthand because Mimi was my first mentor when I was an undergraduate at the University of New Hampshire. Mimi's poems have been published in Poetry Magazine, Harvard Review, The Worcester Review, and Field, to name a few. Her second chapbook, called The Singed Horizon, was selected by Robert Creeley as the recipient of the 2000 Philbrook Poetry Award. In 2008, Deerbrook Editions published her first full-length book, The Last Island, which was awarded the Jane Kenyon Award for Outstanding Poetry. Her most recent publication, Memory Won't Save Me, was published in the fall of 2012 and was nominated for a Pushcart Award. Mimi is collaborating with two visual artists for a 2015 exhibition in Australia. I'm delighted to have her here today. You will love her wisdom and energy. Mimi, thank you for coming down. Thank you for inviting me, Elizabeth. It's wonderful to see you. And thank you for all of your good advice and support. When I was starting out as a writer, I remember at the beginning of your class, I was writing very stilted poems because I was trying to sound like Yeats and Wordsworth. <laughs> And you kept nudging me, no, no, sound like you. Mm. Sound like a woman writing in this year. Mm. Well, you, you did it. And you write wonderful poems. Oh, and you thank did back you. then. Thank you. You're welcome. You have a poem that yes. you're going to share with us. I do. I do. This is from The Last Island um, by Deerbrook Editions. Jeff Haste is the publisher. It's published out of Maine. It's a wonderful press. He cares very deeply about making beautiful books. Someone said to me, <clears throat> I have several bird poems, mm -hmm. which I was surprised to find. And apparently I do. Hmm. So I'm going to read one of those. This is called Field Notes. I watched a bird flitting upside down on a gray sky. She was small as a thumb, striped with rust and speckled rose. I had thought to name her, to locate her genus in a color-plated guide. The bird was neither a robin nor a thrush, but what stills my mind is what I know, a pocket of feathers, an assemblage of song, and when there is no love left to extinguish, the sky. Mm. The language in this poem is beautiful, and it's so bright and so surprising. A pocket of feathers, an assemblage of song. The ending is also so right and yet mysterious. Tell us a little bit about that ending. <laughs> it's a mystery to me, too. I, I can tell you what I think it might be doing. Mm -hmm. um, once I'm into a poem, sometimes the ending inevitably presents itself to me. And I'm trying to figure out then what it was the poem knew that I hadn't arrived at yet mm -hmm. as a piece of information. In that particular place, I'm thinking about birds mm -hmm. and looking at a bird as, a, as something to create love within me. Mm -hmm. And when there was no love, if there's no love left, if there's no love anywhere left to extinguish, there's always the sky. There's always mm -hmm. that sense of hope. And it kind of brings me back to the beginning of the poem. Mm -hmm. I watched a bird flitting upside down on a gray sky. Mm -hmm. And this bird actually did present itself outside my stud study window. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what it was. Um, I did actually end up looking in a, in a guide. But I like the way I did that in the poem where I said, I thought to name her, to locate her genus in a color-plated guide, as if I hadn't bothered to do that. 
but in fact, in real life, I had. Mm -hmm. I was mostly contemplating the bird. And I can't tell you exactly what that means, except so many people like that ending. It's one of those mm -hmm. endings that you can't quite make sense of, and so you keep mining it for, for meaning. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. suppose it's open-ended. Mm -hmm. I still like this poem. I do, too. Good. <laughs> You help people find their authentic voice, and you are so good at helping people find the essence of what is in the poem and what they have to say. What does authenticity mean to you as a poet? I think that when you're authentic, you're very present. Mm -hmm. And when you're very present, or when I am very present, truth will become known. Mm -hmm. It'll become revealed to, to me and to those that I might be working with. Mm -hmm. And it takes, I think, a, a certain amount of courage to be mm -hmm. that present mm -hmm. and to say what is truly on your mind or in your heart. But because we're making poems, we're not just blabbing, we're creating a, a structure, a metaphor mm -hmm. for that truth to be known. Mm -hmm. And everybody has that. Everybody has a thumbprint. Everybody has a, has a voice. Everybody has a walk that's, that's theirs. Mm -hmm. And so in poems, you're just trying to find that authentic piece of that person that's only them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once you find that, there's a great joy Mm -hmm. There's a great joy in knowing who you are at that mm -hmm. moment. Nothing mm -hmm. lasts forever. Mm. <laughs> Nothing. Uh, you have to keep looking. Mm -hmm. You have to keep rediscovering who that self is, which changes all the time. Mm -hmm. Being authentic and honest can be scary for people, at least until they become comfortable with that version of themselves. Mm -hmm. How do you help people who haven't quite reached the point where they can feel that they can be themselves on the page? Well, I, I don't teach as much as I used to. As a matter of fact, I don't teach much at all now. But when I was working with people, it was easiest to find that authentic self in a child. Mm -hmm. And I did a lot of work in schools with, with students. I would come in, I would always know who that kid was mm -hmm. who didn't feel comfortable, mm -hmm. hadn't yet been known in a way, or mm -hmm. made his or herself present in mm -hmm. the classroom. A teacher would say, how do you know this? And I said, well, how do you not know this? How, mm -hmm. how can you not look at this child? Mm -hmm. And so I would, it would always be an intuitive sense mm -hmm. that somebody wasn't available yet. Mm -hmm. And sometimes with a child, it would be a physical sense, the way they moved, the way they would hide or, or not become available. With older people, it's a little harder because they've lot, we've, we, we as older people have lots of tricks, <laughs> lots of tricks of hiding and pretending, mm -hmm. but not children. And so mm -hmm. I learned from them. I learned from them. Mm -hmm. um, and I miss, I miss that work with others. But I have a, another fuller life with you know, children, grandchildren. So mm -hmm. I've swapped some of the other people's children to, mm -hmm. to my, my own family. And mm -hmm. that's a discovery in itself. Mm -hmm. And that's a true gift. It is. It, it, oh, it, well, it mm -hmm. is to me, too, because mm -hmm. they continue to educate me. I mean, my oldest grandson, who's 12, is writing haiku. Mm -hmm. um, and we share them. We share our haiku together. Mm -hmm. Being authentic and honest can be risky. And you were telling me last night that this book felt a little bit risky to you. Tell us why. Well, this is a book that tells the story of a long marriage, as well as some other poems. And in a long marriage, you have, I think I said this to you this evening, you have many marriages. We've been married, my husband and I, a very long time, 45 years. And in telling this story of, of our relationship, there were times when the distance was greater. There were times when we were very close. And even though I created fictions and even though I created metaphor, I was always coming back to whatever that 
deep truth was about what love was. Mm. I was think I was trying to figure out what love was actually, mm -hmm. now that I think about it, within a marriage. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to put it out there because to me it seemed to be personal. Yet so many people have told me, this is my story. Mm -hmm. This is a piece of me in there, mm -hmm. um, which I'm always grateful to hear. Mm. Mm -hmm. We had talked about another poem in this book. Yes. Would you read that for yes, us? Yes, I can read Obad. That's a lovely love poem. This is full of love poems. When I got done with this book, I said to my <laughs> husband, I'm never writing another poem for you. I'm sick of writing about you. <laughs> But he still shows up, <laughs> luckily for me. Um, this poem is Obad, which is a, a morning song. And I was at the Frost Place in Franconia Notch uh, studying poetry. And I was in a little room looking out at the mountains and the White Mountains, I think Lincoln and Lafayette. And my husband sort of comes back to me, although I'm there alone. That's what I think you'll find. That's what the question is at the end. Obad, rain has little to do with love, yet here you are. All the trails up the mountain are steep, you'd said, thinking out loud. Each has a scramble, a rock face, and in rain could be dangerous, you'd said, when I left and drove north. After last night's moon, after the sharp, pencil line of mountain peaks against dusk's falling and rising sky. Rain spattering the screen surprises, and my mind races to locate what bed is this I wake in without you. Mm. That's gorgeous. Thank you. There are many times in these, in these poems I'm looking for him. You know, he's always there, but still that sense of where are we in relation to each other. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That is something that everyone it does to some extent in a relationship. Oh, gosh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we were talking last night. You made several wonderful comments. And so I'd like to just share a few okay. of those and have you just reflect for two or three sentences okay. about things. One of the comments that I really loved and that resonated with me because of poems I'm working on now was this. There is always the emotion that drives the poem. We create a fiction to house the heart. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. In order to revise a poem, I need to know what the initial emotion was that drove me to make a mark on the page mm -hmm. or drove me to repeat a line in my head. Mm -hmm. And for me, that emotion is connected to, to, to my heart center. And in order to make that most clear, I need to find the language that will hold it. Mm -hmm. which to me is about music. For mm -hmm. years it was mm -hmm. about image, and I do have images, but mm -hmm. now it's about music. What can I create to hold that? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I was getting at. Mm -hmm. And the first poem you read for us was so full of music. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. Another thing you said last night was everything we write should risk something. Mm. It doesn't have to be high stakes, but it has to be true stakes. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by true stakes? It has to matter. I, I, I'm not interested in writing poems that are word games. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in writing poems to show off a form, although I like to write in form sometimes, mm -hmm. but only to reveal a truth. I am interested in poems that create meaning for me. And I think that's what I was getting at mm -hmm. in that particular comment. Mm -hmm. um, don't play games. Say what needs to be done. And only write a poem when it needs to be written. Mm -hmm. We don't need to have zillions of poems when we're gone. Mm. But we want to have spent our time engaged in work that mattered. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. So I think that's what I was getting at. Very true. Yeah. You said don't play word games. <laughs> and yet often when someone is writing a poem, a certain amount of fiction comes into the poem. And in some ways, that fiction can actually help you get to the truth yes. of the subject, which seems like uh, it shouldn't happen, but it is oftentimes the essence of what we need to find. Talk about the fictions that help you. That I create? Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose they're metaphors mm. as much as they are fictions because mm -hmm. I tend not to write narrative poetry. Mm. I tend to write short lyric poetry. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like it's a room next door to where you're sitting. Mm -hmm. I think if I can just locate where I can make this happen, mm -hmm. the one poem I'm thinking of that's a newer poem is called The Path, mm -hmm. and it's about where I live. The, the farm that I live on, we don't really farm, but it's an old farm. What can I create, what structure can I create that shows the feeling of living in this place? Mm -hmm. And to me, it's, it's not where I am, but it's next door to where I am. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that's a definition of what a metaphor is. Mm -hmm. I call it a fiction because it doesn't necessarily have the color and the name of the trees. Or mm -hmm. I, I'm creating always language that does seem authentic to the emotion mm -hmm. and then to the place, perhaps. Mm -hmm. mm. Beautifully yeah. put. And I love that idea of, of the room next door. <laughs> well, we live so many lives. We live simultaneous lives when we're writing poems. Mm -hmm. We're living the life of the poem. We're mining the life of the day. Mm -hmm. we're, we're also remembering the lives of the past. Mm -hmm. So much impinges on the making of a poem. What mm -hmm. we've read. Mm -hmm. I'm often embarrassed when I realize, oh goodness, that came from so and so yeah. in some iteration. Um, we can't help ourselves. Mm -hmm. Very true. Last night you also talked about wanting to live more fully. And you said, I am supposed to be present and open. I hunger for authenticity with myself and others. Yeah, I, I don't feel like wasting time. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't need to waste time. I don't have as, have, have as much time. Mm -hmm. We all realize that at some point. And every moment that I am somewhere with you, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with friends, with my family, by myself, mm -hmm. that's what I meant, even when I'm with myself, mm -hmm. which is whom I'm with mostly when I'm writing my poems, mm -hmm. you know, who is that person that I'm most faithful to? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and then when I am there, I feel happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a great joy mm -hmm. in discovering yourself at that moment or that mm -hmm. other who you're talking with. Mm -hmm. Great joy. Just as every poet has many lives, a poet's work has many lives or evolutions. And you talked yesterday about the fact that your work has changed, that it's becoming smaller, clearer. You're less interested in writing a poem that startles or dazzles. You said, Poems still need to help me live my life. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. Um, mm -hmm. The poems are more pared down. And mm -hmm. I always wrote a fairly pared down poem anyway. They were mm -hmm. quite chiseled. Um, what's available to me in these poems is a life that I've lived very fully, that I'm living fully and deeply, mm -hmm. very deeply. Mm -hmm. And the poems are trying very hard to reflect that. Um, dogs show up a lot. The new manuscript that I'm working on is called Stay at the Moment. Mm -hmm. It also includes mm -hmm. deaths of my parents. Um, mm -hmm. Dogs have been guides for me for years. And they teach me to be as essential as I can. You know, They're hungry, they're thirsty, they need to go out. Mm -hmm. um, they're tired. They want you to scratch their belly. 
it's very mm -hmm. clear what they need. Mm. There's not pretense with an animal. Mm -hmm. this, so I think I'm learning from the animals we've lived in all these years how mm. to be as clear and simple as possible. Mm -hmm. I'm becoming more like a dog, I guess, <laughs> which, is, which is a great thing to want to be. Oh, it is. It is. In your work, memory won't save me. You chose a very different form. Tell us a little about the form and why that felt right to you for that particular Manuscript. Mm, thank you for asking that because I think about it a lot. Mm. The book Memory Won't Save Me is written as, as a hyphen, which, which Basho made quite famous. Um, and it combines prose and haiku mm -hmm. to tell a narrative that's often a journey that often ends in enlightenment. As it turned out, I was living in Asheville on vacation when my dad who was sick, got very sick, mm. and we needed to come home. While I was in Asheville, I had assigned myself the task of writing haiku every day. Mm. So I had these haiku in hand, and then we needed to race home, and that was a pretty dramatic journey. And so the hyphen talks about that journey, the time in Asheville, the journey home, the weeks prior to and then following my dad's death. Mm. When I got home, I needed to start to write about that trip, just mm -hmm. the trip itself. And a friend of mine, Mark de Carteret, who's a wonderful New Hampshire poet, said, you have haiku, you're writing prose, why don't you write a haibun? And I said, a what? Mm. I didn't even know what it was. Mm. So I started researching it. And the more I read it, the more I realized it had great elasticity. Mm. As soon as I started writing about my father, my mother, who died almost 40 years ago, showed up. Mm. So it allowed me to, to tell a current story. It allowed me to tell memory. It opened me up to dream possibility. Mm -hmm. And those haiku are interspersed. And I think of them as little, little moments of being that are almost like metaphors mm -hmm. for, the, for the text that comes before it. Mm -hmm. Mm. In this day and age, most people are writing a haibun that's a piece of prose and a haiku. Mm. But people are still writing book-length haikus. Not that, mm. not that often. That's what I chose to do. Mm. And um, it was the perfect form. Mm. It allowed me to tell a story, mm -hmm. but it allowed me those moments of clarity mm -hmm. and insight and mm -hmm. fear mm -hmm. and loss. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a grieving piece mm -hmm. that only poems mm -hmm. can do. Mm -hmm. Would you read the section from page nine? Yes, I would love to. This is the beginning of the haibun. And it start, this little section has two haiku, and I think you'll all can, can sense where they are. The river is cold. Shadows beneath shadows glide, darken steep cliffs. Vivid dreams follow long days of writing. I feel my father hovering. Each day he visits as a feeling or as an image or more fully in dreams. I sit in a wooden rocker in the sun and hold the accumulating pages. I write to the end of what I think is the story of my father's last days, my rush home to see him before he dies. Once upon a time, then a branch snaps, breaks, in every story. When at last I finish writing, my father disappears. Maybe he doesn't need you anymore, my husband Steve suggests, when I tell him that my father has stopped visiting. He never needed me, I say. Mm. Hmm. Uh. <laughs> mm. Punch. <laughs> was it harder to write this form than it was when you were writing the poems for The Last Island? I felt less competent hmm. because a poet writes in lines, and here I had these sentences. I had verbs I had to deal with. I had to make sure that everything I was doing was correct. So I hired a wonderful editor, and she gave me the confidence to continue with the way, way in which I was writing. Hmm. 
I had great joy writing this. Mm -hmm. It's fun writing sentences. There's a little more mm -hmm. movement. It's like dancing across the whole room instead of just <laughs> this little narrow hallway mm -hmm. that we do in poems. Mm -hmm. um, so I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And when did you feel that this form and your voice in it had really reached the point where you wanted to be? When did it feel authentic for you? Moment by moment, moment, by moment bit by bit, mm -hmm. I ended up, someone said, well, how did you do this? I ended up writing a couple of paragraphs, mm. and then I would write a haibun, a haiku. And then sometimes I would write more haiku off somewhere, mm -hmm. and I'd do another paragraph. And as I wrote them, I was waiting to see if they were absolutely what I wanted, so I polished as I went. Mm -hmm. I polished as I went. Mm -hmm. That's how I wrote it. Bit by bit, step by step, line by line, paragraph by paragraph. Mm -hmm. And then the haiku at different times, and I would slide them in, mm -hmm. and I'd mm -hmm. say, oh, that's what's needed. Mm -hmm. Or I'd say, what's needed here? And I'd try to write one, a little haiku to go with mm -hmm. it. We are almost out of time, so would you read the first haiku on page 29? I shall. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> the heart divided between beauty and sorrow lives for centuries. Mm. And good poetry, like your poetry, brings joy, and that will live on. Oh. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming. Thank you, Elizabeth. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. Yes, we're HCAM TV, but movies also? Dive In Drive In is a new program featuring the HCAM staff's favorite B movies. Check our schedule at HCAM.TV for the next showing of some of the more forgotten films. Black and white or color, join Mike Terosian and myself as we introduce and give you some interesting facts about the cast and crews of classic movies. We hope you'll enjoy these treasured films of yesteryear.